Hello, and welcome to our panel on addressing climate change. So today we're going to dive into the energy sector and learn a bit more about what we've been doing over 2021 uh, in delivering uh, energy to meet energy needs whilst tackling the climate crisis. So I'm delighted to have a very uh, distinguished panel joining me, uh, two of our investees and, uh, and two of my uh, close colleagues who are working on this agenda. Uh, just to reiterate, I think, as you've probably already heard in the previous sessions, um, uh, last year was a, a really um, a milestone year, really, for us on climate finance. So we invested almost £1.9 billion in uh, climate financed uh, investments, uh, a record uh, reaching almost 26% of our portfolio. And this also represented a very significant jump from the previous year where uh, we'd made some good investments, uh, but uh, our numbers, uh, particularly following the pandemic, had been uh, rather lower on this. So uh, as we're looking ahead uh, to this five year strategy period, uh, we have really laid very strong foundations for addressing the climate crisis whilst delivering on the development needs, particularly in the energy sector, uh, as has been emphasized earlier and when we'll hear a bit more about in, in this uh, session. And just to reflect on a slightly personal note, uh, I this year had the opportunity to join the Africa Energy Forum in Brussels uh, last month. And for me, that was a really exciting event. Uh, there was a huge buzz, particularly around some of the really innovative opportunities that are starting to emerge in Africa. Uh, green hydrogen, for example, for power use, for use in fertilizer, for use in other uh, in key industrial sectors. And a real uh, hope and recognition that Africa could really lead the way, globally lead the way in accelerating the transition and investments in green hydrogen as a critical enabling technology for decarbonizing uh, Africa and, and the global economy uh, overall. So I think um, rather than uh, talk more uh, myself, I'm going to now introduce uh, Chris Chichichimi, who is our head of uh, equity uh, in infrastructure uh, and has been leading some of our really innovative investments and platforms. And Chris, uh, Chris, you're going to tell us a little bit about um, what you see as some of the highlights uh, for in 2021 um, as a critical year, particularly in renewable energy, but not only in uh, renewable energy. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about some of the progress that was made in 2021? Thank you, Amelie. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Really excited to be on this panel with, um, with colleagues and also with uh, partners uh, in terms of Shiv and Eddie. Um, so for me, last year was a very busy year for us. Uh, if I look first across the infrastructure and climate business, which is where I, I sit within, we invested over 330 million pounds uh, in renewable energy. So this, this is a record number uh, and, and therefore quite a lot of activities took place across our business and across our region. If I pick a couple of key highlights from in terms of key investments we made. So first one being our largest investment in the power space. This is a company called Globalec, a company we own 70% alongside Northfund, the Norwegian DFI. Globalec to me is the largest um, independent power producer and developer in Africa. Uh, it's a company that has grown by a gigawatt since we invested in 2015 in the company. And a lot of the growth of this company is now coming very much in terms of renewable energy. So this company is particularly making a, a, a big impact in the renewable energy space as it applies to Africa. Um, probably a, one key project for me that was delivered last year was one in Kenya, a solar plant called Melindi, 50 megawatt. Um, this is a plant that during the peak of construction, it employed over 3,800 people in, in the Khalifa region in, in, in Kenya. And this is a plant that was also being constructed during the height of COVID. It's now a plant that's completed and it's now producing green energy into the Kenyan grid. So for me, that's a very uh, landmark transaction in terms of what this company did. The company also developed a landmark solar and battery um, transaction in Mozambique. Um, Eddie, who sits on the board alongside myself on Global Egg, hopefully we'll maybe talk a little bit more about that transaction. But for me, those were the two key landmark deals that this business did. Another um, region where we increased our renewable footprint is in Pakistan. 
So in Pakistan, last year, we created and completed a joint venture with a local developer called the Gulamed Group. On day one, the platform will have 110 megawatts of wind power which is currently going into the Pakistan grid. And the ambition of this company over the coming years is to grow five times and to be basically operating and running 500 megawatts of renewable energy in Pakistan. Um, another key business on a platform and, and one that's quite close to my heart in terms of, you know, I come from the continent. One of the key issues around renewables in the continent is the stability of the grid. So there's a company that um, BII formed um, called Gridworks. This is a company very much focused on transmission and distribution. It has now been working in the continent. One of the landmark transactions it's working on is a project called Moyi Power. This is a project in DRC, where the ambition is to build a grid that will in time supply over 600,000 people who are currently not on the grid, who are currently using fossil to basically provide electricity. And the ambition of this business is to get them off fossil and for electrons to be produced from renewable and storage technology, such that in DRC, we are then making a big impact. Uh, and then probably the last one for me very quickly is we've just created a new hydropower platform in Africa. Uh, Nick earlier in the session talked about this business. So this is a business alongside Northfund and Scartec, who are a developer. And the idea really is to harness the hydro potential of the continent of Africa to help the wider energy transition in Africa. So for me, a busy year, but these are probably some highlights for me within the kind of renewable energy space, Amelie. Thank you, Chris. And uh, delighted that we have Eddie uh, Jurong Jurongi, who will who, sorry, who will be talking a little bit more uh, about uh, GlobalX uh, investments across the continent of Africa. But before we do, I'm delighted that we have uh, Shiv Nimbagi, um, who is the Managing Director and CEO of IANA. Uh, IANA is uh, a leading renewable energy uh, investment platform uh, investing in utility scale renewables in, in India. Uh, also has a very um, strong focus on uh, gender and inclusive uh, investments. So Shiv, um, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear more uh, and I know our, our uh, audience love to hear more about your uh, experience with Ayana and how Ayana is uh, both working to tackle the climate crisis through its investments but also very importantly delivering very strong community benefits. Yeah, uh, thanks Amali. Uh, Ayana was started by earlier CDC, now BII, in 2017. And initially we started with a capital outlay of 100 million with an objective to get to about 300 megawatts in three years. And uh, the actual operations got started in Jan 2018. That's when I joined the company. And thereafter, as we speak today in July of 2022, this company is 3.7 gigawatt of capacity with 1.3 gigawatt of operational capacity. So in this journey, right in the first year, after the first year, we were able to attract 220 million additional capital. Uh, in addition to CDC, we had uh, NIF, which is backed by government of India as an anchor investor, and GGF, which again is uh, managed by Everstone Capital and Light Source BP as the managers with uh, funding coming again from NIF and DFID from UK. In thereafter, you know, NIF decided to take majority control with 51%. As on today, now we have a total capital outlay of 720 million. So today, IANA is one of the leading renewable energy companies growing at a good pace. Uh, what we stand out in the country is for our governance standards, our ESG standards, and the work that we do in terms of contributing towards the community. So initial, our objective, which we continue to uphold still, when we started, we had an objective to deploy our capital in category A and B states of the country. So category A and B are those states of the country which actually need development capital. They are not really those destinations where capital gets attracted. So that's why we decided to focus to deploy our capital. And what, you know, with pride, we can say that we were successful in deploying 
uh, a lot of capital, uh, initial capital and a lot of our projects today are operational in the category A and category B states, which is Andhra Pradesh in the southern part and Rajasthan in the northern part. So most of our operational capacity is today located in these two states. So in addition to this, one of the other things that we committed when we started this platform was to make a difference to the communities that, you know, are around where our plants are located. In the very first plant that we commissioned in Andhra Pradesh, we set up a skill development center. We trained about 200 people with about 30 to 40% being women. And uh, we did employ some of them and they're working. And we are trying to work towards uh, trying to encourage more and more female to come and work into our solar plants. Uh, we have a stated objective to see that if we can uh, get one of our solar plants to be fully managed and operated by all women group. So that is what is one of our ambitions, which we are trying to work towards. And the reason that we are looking at skill development is to make sure that the communities become self-sustainable. Our idea is not to give a grant as one time and then you know not be there but our idea is to make sure that people develop the skills and i don't know so what we are now trying to do is unlike setting up a, a skill center which is going to be there for a limited number of training in rajasthan now we have put up a permanent skill development center right at our plant so that we can train a lot of uh, villagers there and empower them so as of now, you know, we have placed almost about 140 people and we are now encouraging a lot of, uh, you know, girls around that area to come and develop the skill sets and be able to, you know, get employment and things like that. So this skill center that we have put up in Rajasthan has really come up well and, you know, we've been able to turn out people and what we have done is all this, there is a lot of solar development in that state. So we have collaborated with a lot of other companies to get placements done. So we are running it as an independent center now and uh, getting training done and it, it's working quite well, I would say. Now in the next project that we are executing currently, which is a wind project. So there, what we intend to do is in addition to the solar skill set, we are seeing actually a demand on the, you know, IT side or the digital side. That's where a lot of demand of jobs is there in the country today. So what we intend to do there is to collaborate with some of the edtech companies in the country, which we've been talking. And uh, Shini has, of course, offered to help us to connect with some of his uh, you know, known contacts in the edtech space. And we intend to put a permanent center there again to be able to skill the people on the digital side. And all these efforts is with an objective to make them employable end of the day. So that's where is the journey of Ayana. Our target going forward is to get to 20 by 10 gigawatts by 2025. Well, thank you. It's really, uh, really interesting to hear. And I think, you know, as you emphasize the importance of strengthening uh, the opportunities for local communities, creating new jobs, um, ensuring that, uh, I think as we refer to, that um, we're contributing through our investments to a just transition as well as, as countries such as India move towards uh, sort of net zero emissions over time. Um, really, really exciting, really interesting, and, and you know, very impressive to hear about the 10 gigawatt uh, by 2025. Uh, target that you have set. Um, of course, India has set a very uh, ambitious uh, target of 500 gigawatts uh, by 2030. And this is clearly a huge, uh, huge scale of investment and uh, presents huge opportunities, uh, but also um, ensures that the need for new capital and, and helping to uh, mobilize new, new finance into this space is, is critical. And I know you've been very successful over the last year uh, in mobilizing new sources uh, of capital. You referred a little bit to that earlier, but could you tell us a little bit more about um, how, you know, what that's been like, your journey in terms of mobilization and, uh, uh, and how you see that as contributing towards your uh, future business? Yeah, so I think capital is, of course, uh, needed and needed in large sums to continue to the areas of growth. The additional capital is required, you know, if we have to do an energy transition and country has declared 
by 2070 to be able to get to net zero. And uh, new technologies like green hydrogen, green ammonia are being talked about. So all this actually calls for, you know, a lot of capital to bring in a lot of renewable energy capacity and also being able to, you know, drive the cost down. The cost will come down unless and until the volume doesn't go up, the cost will not come down. So government of India is trying to enable the policies to create a sustainable market to be able to drive the cost down. So in order to achieve all this, capital is definitely a must. We as IANA now are moving from a standalone solar or wind or hybrid, which is a combination of solar and wind. We are now offering round the clock clean energy, which means 24 by seven with a combination of solar and wind and storage. We should be able to offer a clean energy 24 by seven. So that is when actually, you know, the country is able to achieve net zero, which means that all forms of energy is only clean then. To that effect, we have tied up our storage capacities. So we are now fully geared up in terms of being able to provide a clean energy solution. That's number one. Number two, given that there is a need for an alternate fuel, so we are looking at green hydrogen. So we have, have a technical tie-up with Greenstat of Norway there. And we, in our efforts to get you know, knowledge and experience, we are putting up a pilot, small pilot, close to one of our existing solar plants. In next eight months, we expect to start producing green hydrogen. So that's another area of you know, development which we are trying to do. The third area is where we are putting a lot of focus and effort and developing our own you know, intellectual property is around digitizing our complete operations and developing the required algorithms in terms of managing. And we have established a complete central control room center in our office in Bangalore, where people will be monitoring all our assets 24 by 7, whereby they're able to, you know, look at every nook and corner of the plant other than, you know, analyzing all these assets. So a lot of this is happening. And, you know, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, contribution to the community is core, one of the core you know, principles on which we move. So for all this, of course, capital is required. And our ambition is to become one of the major contributors for India's journey in the energy transition. Very exciting. And I, I'm going to be in Bangalore in a couple of weeks. So I'd love to <laughs> go and visit your control center because I know we're hoping love to, to have you. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I'm going to come back to you in a, uh, in a little while, but um, I'm going to turn now to Eddie uh, Jurogi, who is um, a non-executive director at GlobalEC. Uh, so Chris, uh, Chris earlier referred to GlobalEC uh, as one of our key uh, investees where we are investing in the power sector in Africa. So Eddie, uh, could you tell us a bit more about Globalec? Uh, uh, you know, you're one of the leading IPPs in Africa. Tell us a bit more about what, what that looks like and also how you see uh, the relationship with BII. Thank you. Thank you, Amari. And really, thank you for inviting me also to participate uh, in this panel discussion, which I feel is, is a great way of communicating in terms of what we are doing. Uh, Globalec was a company which was acquired from Actis in 2015 uh, by BII and no So we are owned 70% by BII and 30% uh, by no fund. And as you have just said, and Chris had said so earlier, we are indeed one of the leading IPPs uh, in Africa. Uh, we recently acquired um, a solar project in uh, Egypt, uh, a 60 megawatt uh, project, 66 megawatt project, which really made us to be in every corner of Africa. Before that, we were mainly in South Africa, where we have about 380 megawatts. We were in West Africa uh, through Cote d'Ivoire and Cameroon, where we have about 800 megawatts. And in East Africa, we were in Tanzania through Songas and servo power in Kenya, uh, which we have retired now servo power. We still have strong gas in Tanzania, which is about 190 megawatts of gas. And uh, recently, as um, Chris again mentioned, uh, we have just finished Malindi Solar, 
uh, which is uh, one of the best solar projects in the coast area uh, of Kenya. And there is also a development that we are doing in Mozambique in gas and uh, solar, which I'll be talking about later on. Um, so in terms of the total installed capacity right now, we have about 1,456 out of all those that I have mentioned across the continent and generating about seven gigawatts and serving about nine million people, which is, uh, no, which is, which is a really big impact um, on the continent. And we come from a point of view that uh, we just don't look for returns, we also look for impact. So any of those developments that we have done uh, are developments that have real impact on the country, on the people of the country and the economic well-being of, of those countries. And therefore we have also invested quite a lot on, on the socio-economic development of those places that we invest and especially in South Africa. Uh, we have had um, over 185,000 people who have benefited from the socioeconomic development projects that we have. I also need to say that Robrec now in line uh, with BII, um, BII policies, we are also committed to net zero by, by 2050. And any of the projects that we are now going into are being uh, scrutinized in terms of the NDCs of the various countries and to make sure that they're in line and that they will, we will be looking at getting to net zero uh, by, 20, uh, by 2050. Uh, so we will be going more and more into, into the renewables. Uh, we are going into geothermal also in Kenya, which is the first time that we are doing that. There is a project which um, we have negotiated and we are just waiting for one final step uh, to be able to do that. Uh, so in the renewable space, we will be in the, in the solar, wind, uh, geothermal, and uh, we are reducing in terms of the others, the gas and the HFOs. Uh, you also asked about our relationship with BII, which has been great. And we feel that BII is not just an investor, uh, just giving us funding, uh, but also in terms of policy, uh, and especially in the ESSG, um, we have had a lot of input from, um, uh, from BII as we developed our climate strategy, um, as we developed our sustainability reports, we have had a lot of support from BII, uh, which we value uh, greatly. Um, so that's really us, that's uh, Globalec, and I'll be talking a bit uh, maybe let's on about what we intend to do going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I'll just come back one more question, um, Eddie, um, maybe fairly briefly, because I, I know uh, last year, Globalec, um, uh, with actually some, uh, some funding we were able to contribute, uh, was able to invest in a new, uh, very innovative, um, the Kwamba solar plant, which includes storage. Uh, so we heard from Shiv how uh, Ayana in India are seeing storage as critical to really uh, scaling up uh, investments, getting to net zero. Could you maybe just say a few words about um, the Kwamba project in Mozambique? Yeah, Kwamba came, we were developing, or we are in the process of developing a huge gas project in, uh, in Mozambique. And uh, as part of that, we then negotiated with the government and they agreed for us to put up a 19 megawatt uh, power solar project uh, with storage. And the significance of this is that this is the first um, IPP in Sub-Saharan Africa with storage, for instance. And uh, we feel that for Mozambique, for instance, is going to be one of the many, and we are privileged to have been the one who have brought this sort of uh, arrangement uh, projects um, to Mozambique, and we hope to scale up and do more of those, uh, not just in Mozambique, uh, but perhaps across the sub-Saharan Africa. Excellent. Very exciting. And yeah. Um, yeah, really, really great. So I'll come back with one last question to yourself and Shiv at the end, but I'm going to move now back to uh, my British international investment colleagues. Um, so Jeff, Jeff Manley, you're leading our energy access and efficiency team. 
Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your uh, year in 2021, um, you know, how you've laid the foundations for this five year strategy period? And, and also, was there any particular standout investments that you'd like to uh, talk about uh, and, and let our audience uh, know more about? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, very pleased to, to join you all. Um, so maybe just to give a bit of a background and a picture of what we do within our team. Um, so we're really focused on two areas and uh, as really part of our broader approach uh, within the infrastructure and climate group. So we're focused on decentralized renewable energy and we are focused on resource efficiency. And when we talk about decentralized renewable energy or DRE, we really sort of think of it about it in three segments. Um, one is solar home systems, um, which are often sold on a pay-as-you-go basis. Um, this is really providing basic energy access to underserved households, um, primarily in rural areas. Um, a second area that we look at is commercial and industrial or CNI solar, which is providing solar solutions to businesses. It allows them to reduce their carbon footprint. It allows them to reduce their cost of power uh, and improve reliability. And then the last area would be mini grids, um, which electrify communities. Um, it touches households, it touches businesses, and, and provides them with, um, with power. And then, so that's sort of the DRE side of it. And then the other side um, is resource efficiency. And um, there we're looking both at energy efficiency, but also water efficiency, which is really, I think, key components in addressing the climate challenge going forward. Um, these are very nascent and risky sectors. Um, in many cases, the companies are pre-profit. So you probably heard my colleague uh, Yasmin talk about our catalyst window earlier. And uh, the EAE team is really kind of a catalyst power user. So that's really the primary um, source of that more flexible capital that allows us to invest in earlier stage businesses. And um, given that these are evolving markets, um, a core part of our strategy is well is to play a role in market shaping and what we mean by that is intervening at the sector level um, to try to encourage the healthy growth um, so for example we used our BII plus TA facility to help fund the development of a consumer protection code um, to ensure that customers are treated fairly and with with transparency so that's that's an important component of, of what we do um, I guess thinking about some uh, key transactions or progress that we made in 2021, I think I would highlight um, our continuing relationship um, with a really exciting company called Greenlight Planet. Um, this was a second facility that we closed with them in 2021 um, to support their continued growth. They are a solar home systems company with a global footprint. Um, Kenya is their largest market. This was a local currency facility for Kenya. And I think I would also really note that we were able to bring in two commercial lenders into that facility, which is really exciting alongside um, some of the other DFIs. And I think it's a really strong signal um, to the market that um, you know, this, this sector can develop in a, in a commercial way. So that was really exciting for us. Um, another point uh, I would highlight, you know, we talked about the importance of partnership and um, others mentioned the partnership agreement that we signed uh, at the last COP with the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, and that has a very strong DRE or decentralized renewable energy component to that. Um, so really excited to build on that um, over the next five years. It ties into our ambitions about um, you know, using blended capital structures, um, and so very excited to, uh, to see that take off over the next five years. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And I think, you know, that's really important that uh, we all um, are reminded this isn't about just supply of power and, you know, installation of, you know, capacity of electricity, but critically access uh, is essential, uh, particularly in many, many of the rural areas, particularly in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, um, but also critically the more efficient use of energy and water. I mean, water we know is, is um, Absolutely. going to become increasingly scarce. So, I mean, is there a few words you could say, maybe just to unpack what you see as some of the challenges um, and opportunities as well, but some of the challenges that uh, you you were facing in, in 2021 and, you know, looking ahead to 2020, uh, this year and beyond? Sure. I mean, 
it's been said uh, many times already, but obviously COVID was a huge overhang in 2021. Um, that presented a lot of challenges uh, in our markets at the household level. And a lot of the companies that we're working with are targeting more vulnerable, lower income households. Um, so that was, you know, a, a particular focus area for us to try to understand what was happening there, but also at the company level, um, lockdowns and, um, and other challenges prevented them from delivering on their business plan. So we really made a concerted effort to try to support our portfolio companies to work with them and understand, um, you know, kind of what was happening in their markets and how we could support them in response to, um, to that crisis. Um, I mean, the, obviously the, the climate challenge is one that we we all know about. Um, I guess maybe what I might focus on as well is the energy access challenge. And um, there's some good news and bad news, I think. Um, we saw that in 2020, um, energy access globally uh, went over 90%, um, which is a fantastic uh, data point. But there are still 700 million people that lack access to power. Most of these people are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so that continues to be a huge challenge. And I think we really just have to make sure that COVID or you know, other global macro challenges don't derail the progress towards energy access and energy access that is compatible with our net zero ambitions, which means renewable. Great, thank you. And um, and I think, as you say, of course, it becomes more important to have these uh, very strategic partnerships with with those that can bring complementary resources, such as the. And, sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say maybe one opportunity that I would highlight is that um, we are starting to see um, some of the companies in our portfolio, more specifically, um, developing their business in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, Nigeria is the largest energy access market. In other words of all the countries in the world, it has the most people without access to modern uh, energy. And we also know that in parallel, um, there are gigawatts of installed capacity of uh, highly polluting diesel gensets. Um, so I think there's a tremendous opportunity there to both address energy access and climate through mm -hmm. solar solutions. Great, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so I'm gonna come back one, one last very brief um, Question to you, Chris, if you could highlight one uh, standout investment from last year, um, just very briefly, because then I'd like to come back to Shiv and Eddie for a final um, closing remarks. Thanks, Emily. So maybe just thinking through this. So one standout investment um, for me is um, likely our hydropower joint venture. So this is a joint venture I talked about earlier on, which is focused on harnessing what we know exists in the continent, which is the hydro capability. And the reason why it stands out for me, and, and as I think about the wider energy transition, um, hydro energy potentially could be a game changer in terms of pro providing base load. Me, and you know, base load has been one of the limiting factors to being able to have more renewables on the grid across the continent of Africa. So I think the transaction which we've just done has the potential not only from a job creation perspective, you know, we, we, the numbers we've talked about with this transaction based on the, um, try, um, the pipeline it has is about 180,000 potential jobs, potentially 3 million people to be supplied with electricity, just from three other projects in the pipeline. So the potential with that transaction for me is huge in terms of game changing and helping the wide energy transition in the continent. So that's probably one that stands out, Emily, in, in, if I think through and, what we did last year. And which countries will be benefiting from that? Hydro potential is across the continent. So, you know, if, if I think through where the potential, so there's, there's wider West Africa, there's a lot of hydro potential there. East and Central Africa, lots of existing hydro. A number of the projects the company is looking at, um, there's the three country hydro called Ruzizi 3. So that's mm -hmm. DRC, Rwanda, Burundi. Mm -hmm. There is um, Malawi. There's a project in Malawi, 350 megawatt hydro plant. There is one in Madagascar. Um, it has an existing operation asset in Uganda. And I think there's a lot of existing hydros built in the 60s, 50s that have been moribund and require rehabilitation. And I think this JV is also going to target and focus on those. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say for me, pan continent, but largely in the kind of middle part of sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, and I think that's critical. I certainly something so in my previous role in Latin America that the upgrade of uh, existing hydro uh, is is an important part of 
of delivering energy security and decarbonizing as well. So I'm going to come back very briefly now to Shiv and uh, Eddie. If you could just maybe in you know one or two sentences say what you would like to see um, investors like ourselves, British International Investment, what you'd like to see us focusing on uh, to have greatest impact in our markets uh, with regards to addressing the climate crisis. So uh, Shiv, uh, over to you. Okay, so I think uh, the biggest thing is now, you know, given all the macros uh, that have been happening around the world in terms of energy security and everything else. So what is important is to really uh, be focused in terms of how to uh, get uh, an acceleration towards energy transitions and uh, uh, supporting the technologies, especially in terms of storage, green hydrogen and green ammonia and these type of technologies, which will help in accelerating, uh, you know, those developments, make it affordable, and at the same time, support the nations in terms of securing their energy needs. So I think those should be the areas in my view, because that will obviously, you know, eliminate the impact of the climate and lead us to a better environment for the future generations. Great, thank you. So Eddie, Yes, uh, just a quick one, uh, uh, just to conclude. Um, Africa is still energy deficient, and therefore there is a lot of scope for us to, to help. There are six, over 600 million people uh, who do not have access to modern electricity even to date. And yet, uh, Chris has just talked about the hydro capacity. There is a huge hydro capacity. Solar is really a very good resource. 85% uh, of the country, of the continent landscape has got over 2,000 uh, kilowatt hours per square meter. Uh, wind is estimated at about 1,300 uh, gigawatt, uh, gigawatt. And we have geothermal, of course, which is about 15, uh, 15 gigawatts. So the potential is there, the resources are there, and the demand is there. What we need is uh, investors to really come and exploit that and be able to, uh, to help us exploit the resources. Uh, one of the things that um, obviously is important is the jet that you talked about in South Africa in terms of climate, uh, the, the contribution, for instance, of uh, uh, people like BII in, in that whole project. And we as Globalec would want to accelerate and be in the lead uh, to be able to help uh, that transition, not, not just in South Africa, but perhaps across across the, the continent. Yeah, oh, over Thank to Thank you Thank very you. much. And you brought, Thank yes, you. the Just Energy Transition Partnership, a key yes. initiative. I, uh, our CEO, Nick O'Donoghue, referred to that as well in his um, uh, the earlier session. So I think, you know, just to summarise, I think based on um, all the, the great discussion and insights from uh, all of our panellists, I mean, it sounds like uh, we are hopefully on the right track. We've built the right foundations. Um, we've got to continue to innovate. Uh, we've critically got to help uh, drive down the costs and bring, uh, in short, affordability of these more innovative technologies and solutions. Uh, a big focus on partnerships and the need to partner uh, with investees such as uh, IANA and, and Globalec, uh, as well as with others uh, who can bring very complementary resources and, uh, and expertise to this agenda. And uh, we certainly have a very big agenda over this next five year strategy period. Uh, but I think with the foundations we've built, uh, I feel confident and I hope uh, our panelists and the audience do that we really are um, on track to really uh, help our, uh, our countries, our markets respond to, unfortunately, the triple crisis of climate, uh, the pandemic and, of course, uh, poverty uh, reduction that is so essential to, to uh, enabling that. So uh, thank you, everyone. And um, I'll now hand back to... To Lindsay, who will um, introduce and convene the last panel. Thank you. Bye bye.